Please be seated. Last month, Michael and I were set to fly to a conference he runs. Um, Michael's my husband. Um, we were set to fly off to a conference that he runs in Nantucket. And because the tickets were more affordable, we, were, we booked to fly out of Charlotte with a connection through Boston. So really early one morning, we packed up the car and headed out. Halfway to the airport, Michael's phone started buzzing and dinging. Our flight had been canceled. Not good. He needed to get there, so he got on the phone with an attendant. I did not pay much attention. I heard something about routing us through Chicago. He didn't much like that idea. They went back and forth, settled on something, and he hung up. All good, I asked. Yep, all good. I did not know anything was up until we landed in Boston. That is when he started acting weird. <laughs> I assumed that was because we were pushed for time. We had booked with American. Our first flight was with American, but we left the American concourse. That is when I started asking questions. What airline? I'm not exactly sure. I just have the gate number. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Michael knows I do not much like to fly. I manage my fear by refusing window seats when I can, and if I cannot, I fly with the shade down. Basically, I pretend I am on a bus. <laughs> I figured we were changing airlines when we had to walk to another concourse. We had to rush to make the connection. There wasn't much time to think. We walked from one end of the airport to another, walked and ran, slowed to catch our breath and ran some more. I did not calculate what exactly this might mean until we came to a terminal so blasted far from our original flight that it had concrete floors. <laughs> Cape Air. Regional flights. I knew what this could mean. Very small airplanes. But there were 20 or so people milling around, so I thought surely it would be a decent-sized plane. Then they called the flight to Hyenas. People rose and headed through the double doors. Exactly what sort of plane will be flying to Nantucket? I asked the woman seated beside me. Michael leaned over to her and said, do me a favor and do not answer that question. <laughs> The woman smiled. She said, I'll tell you this much, you have to give your body weight to get on the plane. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And they will weigh your purse, which they did. And I added 10 pounds to my body weight. Michael asked why I lied upwards and I said, because people lie all the time in the other direction about their weight. <laughs> and I wanted the plane to stay in the sky. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. These are reassuring, pleasant words. We must understand that the disciples did not know the end of the Jesus story. They were living in the present moment with the man teaching love in such a powerful way that the crowds were following him. Luke said they numbered in the thousands. It made sense what they heard, this kingdom of love, an invitation. Do not be afraid of the kingdom of love. So we expect that it would be a nice, uneventful flight, no turbulence. Except that's not what Jesus had in mind. Jesus tells his disciples, do not be afraid. And then he walks them right up to the edge of the cliff. He says, sell everything. Let go of everything you're holding on to. Let it all go. 
Do not be afraid in the Gospels is not a reassurance that nothing will be asked of us. That we will get to stay 10 steps from the precipice. Jesus tells the disciples, do not be afraid, and then ask of them the scariest thing, to release everything. Jesus tells the disciples not to be afraid, and then he tells them to jump. At least since the 5th century, Christianity has lived into these words, do not be afraid. And we can credit St. Augustine with our attitudes towards it, our theology of it. It's a theology of the cross that's entrenched itself in the West. Augustine articulated what is called substitutionary understanding of the work of Christ. These are Augustine's words. God sent his son to bear his wrath and absorb the curse. If you interpret the Christ event in this way, then Jesus died on the cross as a substitution for the death we owed because of our status as fallen sinful people. We can understand the Christ event then as something that protects us. Because of the cross, then we get to board a big jumbo jet to the other side without buying a ticket. We have grown accustomed to the do not be afraid part of the gospel, and our theology has wrapped itself around it. We dodge the part about selling our possessions. Because what we are most afraid of is the very thing Jesus asked of his disciples. What is it that possesses you? 20th century British thinker C.K. Chesterton noted, Christianity isn't a failure. It just hasn't been tried yet. There's another way to understand the faith. A Christianity we may just be brave enough to try. And it requires our deepest strength because it is a faith that doesn't protect us into the kingdom of love, but propels us into it. Let go of what possesses you, Jesus said. Do not be afraid because that is the only way to cross over to the other side. In this way, you will get to the better country that Paul named in the letter to Hebrews. A city prepared for us. Our security then comes not from what we hold on to but from what we release. Give alms, says Jesus. We are not to give until it hurts. That is not the point. We are to give until we are transformed. We give it away, let it go, so that we can come to what is essential, so we can come finally to what is beneath the self-possession. This is not a new way of understanding the faith. I did not come up with it, that's for sure. Abraham was sitting in his comfortable tent with Sarah, and they heard a call to set out and leave it all behind for something new. It's as old as our faith. Paul remembered Abraham in his letter to the Hebrews. He left his home to find his home. Abraham set out to receive his inheritance. He had to dislocate himself to find himself. Jung said that our worst and most original sin is deviation from the Newman. Deviation from the essential person we are. Allowing possession to overwhelm the light of us. Allowing the little petrified self to hold the keys to our interior rooms. So we can't get in there. Lou Ann and I were asked this week, it was a um, serviceman that was in the building, what exactly do Episcopalians believe? We have a catechumen if you want to read it. But the catechumen won't mean so much if you have not tapped into the inner body.
body of knowledge that comes from taking the keys and living into your own self. Dispossessing the little self invites the emergence of the true self, right? Belief is of little consequence, does not matter what we believe so much as how much we tap into the wisdom of the tradition. Christianity isn't a failure. Perhaps it just hasn't been tried yet. When we boarded the plane, oh, when the people boarded the plane for hyenas, it only left a few people standing in our terminal, four people to be exact, and one was the gate attendant. Three of us were escorted down a set of stairs and outside and instructed to walk within a corridor demarcated in yellow lines along a row of relatively small aircraft that got smaller the further we got from the terminal. <laughs> we stopped. It was definitely the smallest one. There was nothing smaller anywhere in sight. <laughs> well, it's not a hang glider, said Michael. This is a poem from Mary Oliver. It's called Storage. When I moved from one house to another, there were many things I had no room for. What does one do? I rented a storage space and filled it in years past. Occasionally, I went there and looked in, but nothing happened, not a single twinge of the heart. As I grew older, the things I cared about grew fewer, but were more important. So one day I undid the lock and called the trash man and he took everything. I felt like the little donkey when his burden is finally lifted. Things, burn them, burn them. Make a beautiful fire. More room in your heart for love, for the trees, for the birds who own nothing. It's the reason they can fly. More room in your heart for love. Richard Rohr reminds us that by the early second century, Christians were already calling themselves Catholics. They were calling themselves the universals. At the front of their consciousness was a belief that God was leading all of history somewhere larger and broader. Then Augustine came. The little petrified self tells us that the I is everything. Do not be afraid. Christian salvation is more than our personal salvation. And it was bigger from the very start of this faith. Abraham and Sarah set out not knowing where they were going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land that he had been promised, but he lived in a tent. They grew old and still he did not see it all complete. And God said then, you will have a child. As many as the stars of heaven and the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. What we cannot see is beyond us. And it's like that in the sacraments of the church. In baptism, we receive the self of the spirit. The I. But we bring our baptism every week to the Eucharist. And in the Eucharist, we lose ourself into this bigger thing, into this community and into the world. We become one with one another. We become one with Abraham and Sarah. We become one with the children of the future and they will bring their backpacks next Sunday and we will bless them. It is infused in our Christian story. We are meant to expand. This expansion 
is not a nuance of Christianity. It's not that we have personal salvation and then we think about this other thing later. This is the Christian faith. Expansion is our salvation. That is the better country. The seat on the airplane was like one of those, you know what the flight attendant sits in? It's a little thing that pops down out of the wall. It's that kind of thing. Michael, he's a good man. He said to me, you've got this. I closed my eyes and I said, I will see you in Nantucket. <laughs> but halfway there, he says to me, you really should look out the window. And the thing about a small plane is that you can't pretend you're on a bus. <laughs> Propellers. Um, and it was extraordinary, of course, because we can see the land and the beaches and the beautiful blue water. And this came to me. I am part of this. I am part of this. When the plane landed, the pilot said, it wasn't so bad, was it? I said, no, it was really extraordinary. Thank you. And he said, why don't you come up with me on a stormy day? <laughs> Christianity isn't a failure. It just hasn't been tried yet. Amen.